Well, this morning we are glad to once again be able to open up the scriptures. And uh, this morning I'd, I'd invite you to open up to Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, 17. Reading from the New American Standard, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls, as though who, those who give an account. Human authority is the power delegated to someone or to somebody to make decisions or to enforce laws with respect to those under said authority. Most people uh, without the church, that is outside of the church, view authority as domination. They view it as control or subjugation. And regardless, though, of the perception of pagan authorities concerning the origin of their authority, God is the only true source of authority. God is the only true source of authority. In Romans 13.1, we read the Apostle Paul's statement to this point. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Now, what this tells us then is that God is the only source of authority. He's the one that's instituted governmental authority. And this is seen no more clearer than in an exchange between our Lord Jesus Christ himself and Pilate in John 19.10. And this conversation took place during the phony Roman trial that Jesus was subjected to. And here's what verse 10 of John 19 says. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Well, these words are clear. God has established all civil authorities, and likewise, God has also instituted authority in the family. Uh, he placed the husband to be the head of the wife, saying in Ephesians 5.22 and the next two verses as well, and as we also uh, read in Colossians 3.18. Well, here's what Paul writes. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. In everything. Did I say in everything? We also find the establishment of authority in the family expressed uh, by Paul's statements in Ephesians uh, 6, 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. First commandment with a promise. So that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Then, too, God has instituted authority in the workplace, as we see in Ephesians 6, 5 through 8. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 also talk about that. In fact, uh, out of Ephesians uh, 6, let's just look at verses 5 and 6 for a moment. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And then finally, God has instituted authority in the church by having Christ be not only the foundation, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 3.11, but also its builder, as he stated to Peter and the others in Matthew 
1615. But he's also placed Jesus as the head of the church, as we've already read in uh, First or in Ephesians uh, uh, 122. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. And then there's Colossians 1.18. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And then, to support the leadership of the church, the guidance of the church, God has placed men as his under-shepherds, men to lead the church in its and its many local congregations in the daily work of ministry. And you know the verse as well, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. Here's what they tell us. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And by the way, pastors and teachers is the same office. It's not pastors and then also teachers. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And of course, I could talk a long time about how that it is not the pastor's job to do all of the work of the ministry. That is your responsibility. The pastor's job is simply to equip you, to teach you how to do it. And then you, the church, are to do the work of the ministry, the visitation, the calling, the evangelism, and so on and so forth. So God uh, institutes civil authority and family authority, employment authority, and of course authority in the church. He is the one who institutes the concept of authority. I want you to listen to the words of, of, of this verse closely. Colossians 2.10, here's what it says. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Jesus is all authority. He holds it all. But why is this so? Why does he establish authority structures in the world? The purpose for the institution of authority structures is for the maintenance and order within human life. So it's for maintaining order and harmony among men. And this uh, could be no truer than, of course, in the Church of Jesus Christ itself. If uh, there is one place where order and harmony are necessary, it is in the church, since it is the very body of Christ. And uh, thus this body of Christ is to reflect the character and actions of God. So when the church is divided and there are squabbles and all kinds of infightings, it's like when the body is sick and the body must be given medicine to recover. And so God has given us leaders in the church so that they can help us heal the body. So God then has imposed a duty upon every Christian, a duty that uh, results in a reciprocal responsibility between the congregants and his pastor or its pastor. We see it in the words, obey your leaders and submit to them. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Hence, the God-imposed obligation and responsibility of the believer is to obey and to submit to the pastor's authority. Let me make that a little more explicit. It means that every congregant is to obey his teaching and submit to his authority. To obey his teaching and submit to his authority. The verb peito, to, uh, uh, to obey, literally means uh, to become persuaded, to follow freely. So the idea is that believers will follow trustingly, that they will follow their pastor trustingly because they have been persuaded of the truth of what he is saying. But notice that the verse also says that believers are to submit they are to submit. They are to hupeiko, 
to their leader. This word hupeiko essentially means to resist no longer. So we're told, stop fighting the authority. Stop fighting your pastor. Resist no longer. It means resist no longer. It also means to yield to, to give in. Two. All of this, of course, conditioned upon the pastor being truly a man of God, a man of the Word, a man who is a genuine shepherd of Jesus Christ. Now, these words are distinguished as follows. We have to know what the difference between peito and hupeiko is. And so they're distinguished in that the first, patho, obey, carries the idea that the believer must follow trustingly because he has been persuaded of what the pastor is saying is truly biblical and true. And hupeko carries with it the idea that the believer must follow trustingly even if he disagrees. Even if he disagrees. So long as your pastor is not teaching you heresy and leading you to heretical belief or leading you to do something which would be against the law, something against God's word, you follow along, even if you disagree. That's quite a requirement. Obedience and submission to one's leaders are key to the church. They're key to the church's strength. A church will only be so strong as its congregants are willing to obey the teaching of the word of God as given to them by their pastor. Obedience and submission to the pastor of the church is key because it is necessary for the health of the church so that instead of infighting or gossip or criticism, people will submit in harmony. So, Obedience and submission to the leadership of your pastor is absolutely key for maintaining order and harmony in your church. And uh, you may say, really, obedience and submission to the pastor is the glue of the church. It's the glue that holds the church together. You see, when these two words are put into practice, they lead us to four Things, four things that become evident. The first is that God will be glorified because it'll show God's love and it'll show how God's power can work to unify a body who, though may differ on certain things, is able to nevertheless work united. Second, not only is God glorified, but when people are obedient and submissive to the leading of their pastor, they demonstrate a love for the church. The love for the church is lived out. A love for the church is lived out. You see, we all have to love the church. It's not merely about loving certain people in our local congregation. It's not simply about loving our pastor. We have to have a love for the church. And I don't mean just the local church, but the global church of Jesus Christ to such a point that we're willing to endure perhaps some differences in order to maintain the unity in the local church, which will then impact on the reputation of the global church of Jesus Christ. So if we are obedient and submissive to the leadership of a pastor, God will be glorified, love love for the church will be lived out, and third, unity is exercised. We cannot possibly have unity if we are not obedient and submissive to the leadership that God has placed over us. And then fourth, Expansion of the kingdom is achieved because when people are obedient and submissive to their pastor, they will follow his teaching with respect to the necessity for evangelism and discipleship, and they'll submit to his authority to become involved in these activities, and therefore the church can do nothing but grow. Obviously, if people aren't obedient and submissive, it'll hurt the church. So we know that the responsibility of the believer then is to obey and to submit to his pastor. Now let's look at the other side. 
The obligation and responsibility of every pastor is to keep watch over every soul charged to his care. Charged to his care. It's essential that we understand that he's responsible for them, not simply because maybe he won them to Christ, but because Jesus Christ has trusted and trusted these souls to his care. Our text puts it this way. For they, agrupmeo, keep watch. They keep watch over your souls. That's the pastor's job. Again, his job is not to do the work of the ministry. His job is to train you. His job is to guard over you, to watch for your well-being so that you can be healthy as a church, as individuals that form that church to do the work of the ministry. Congregants are to obey their pastor's teaching and submit to his authority because they realize that pastors do what they do and say what they say for the congregants best. They do what they do and say what they say with the congregants best in mind. Why do they do that? Because they understand that it is God's imposed duty upon every pastor to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, season, because they realize that it is every pastor's job to reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, as Paul wrote to Timothy in his second pastoral epistle to Timothy. Now, this means that pastors must be concerned with the spiritual, emotional, moral, and perhaps even physical welfare of the souls that attend his church, of the people that are a part of the body of his church. This is why church membership is so important. See, if there is no church membership, then really the pastor has no authority over you, and you Present yourself every time you come as one who is not under the authority of an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ. It's every Christian's responsibility to be then a member of a local congregation so that they can be under the direction and leadership and care of a pastor. Now this business of caring for the flock, of watching for the flock, is a huge Work. It's a heavy work. It's a heavy work. We know this because keep watch, agrupmeo, gives the idea of chasing sleep away. Chasing sleep away. And uh, this, is, this is done in order to assure the well-being of the believers. So pastors are to always be on the alert. They are to always be attentive. They are to be tirelessly working for the good of the believers under his care. The efforts of pastors in guarding the souls of their congregants is assured. It is obligatory because they keep watch for the souls of believers that belong to Jesus Christ. Our text says that they keep watch as those who will give an account. As those who will give an account. Pastors have a keen interest, or at least they should, have a keen interest in the well-being of his congregants, of the members of his church, because they know that God holds them, the pastors, accountable for how they keep watch over their congregations. God holds them accountable for how they, the pastors, keep watch over you, the congregants. He's not held responsible for your disobedience. He's simply held responsible for how he helps you to grow and to learn and to become obedient. Hence, the good under-shepherd of Jesus Christ will expend whatever energy He'll employ whatever effort and he'll spend whatever time may be necessary to assure the good of those that he pastors. This being so, it begs the question, well, 
How or with what attitude should pastors exercise their authority as they watch for the souls of the believers? Let me make it very, very clear. <clears throat> One would say, let me make it perfectly clear that the pastor of God has no authority in and of himself. He has no authority in and of himself. God has the authority. We've seen that. He's the head of the church. God has the authority, and the pastor is merely God's mouthpiece that exposits his written will, the Bible, so that the Holy Spirit can then transform Christians. So the pastor's authority then is limited to what the Word of God says. The pastor's authority is limited to preaching and teaching the Word of God clearly, correctly, and convincingly. Remember how we said that to obey means to, be, to follow, trustingly being persuaded? So the pastor's job then is to preach the Word of God clearly, correctly, and convincingly. Other than that, he doesn't really have authority to tell people who to marry or what car to buy or what college to go to. And naturally, pastors can and should give biblically-based counsel in these and in many, many other areas. But he can never tell people what they ought to do based on his own opinion, based on his own intellect, based on his own desires alone. Everything that the pastor asks people to do ought to have a biblical basis. So again, whatever counsel he gives, whatever he, he tells people to do must be based on biblical commands and principles, not on his own personal thinking or views, or desires, or preferences. When authority is used as God intended it, that is, for man's good, then it ought to be a reflection of God's power. It ought to reflect God's wisdom. God's love ought to be expressed through that use of authority. But just as any misuse of anything that God intends for man's good is sin, so too the abuse of authority is sin. The abuse of authority by a pastor is sin. And especially when that authority or that abuse of authority is being exercised by a pastor. Because the pastor must be above reproach. The pastor must be absolutely above reproach. That's why it's, in a certain sense, a very frightful thing to be behind a pulpit, to claim the title pastor. Abuse of authority lies when pastors use intimidation, when they use manipulation to get what they want, when they blame others, when they use fear and guilt in order to exercise control over those whom God has placed under his authority. These things cause instability and, and insecurity because these tactics are a violation of God's will. Pastors and elders are never to be tyrants in the exercise of their authority. And the reason is that pastors don't rule for themselves. They're not their own little kingdom. Pastors have authority only by God's grace and for God's glory. And they rule for God. They don't rule for themselves. Consider 1 Peter with me for just a moment. If you're able to do this, turn to 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 3. Listen to how God tells pastors they ought to lead through the Apostle Peter, he tells them. Therefore, I exhort the elders or pastors among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory which is to be revealed. Shepherd, that is care, lead, feed, the flock of God among you, exercising 
oversight. Not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. And not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. <clears throat> Nor as yet, as lording it over those allotted to your charge. <clears throat> but proving to be examples to the flock. Oh my. We could spend easily three weeks on these verses. But the idea is that abuse of any kind has no place in the pastor-sheep relationship since the, chief, the, the sheep belong to God. And by the way, did you notice that the sheep are not beneath the pastor in importance and in value to God? We're told here in 1 Peter that the pastors, the elders, are to shepherd what? The flock. They are to shepherd the flock. And how are they to do that? They are to shepherd the flock among you. They are to shepherd the flock among you. So, they are just as important, that is, the congregation, the, the, the uh, church members are just as important of the past, as the pastor is. The pastor isn't some glorified leader above them. He's a servant. Jesus Christ, God himself incarnate, said that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. The pastor is your servant, and you are his servants. Thus, there is no room for misuse of authority. So how do these abusive pastors or do their thing? How does abusive authority or abuse of authority reflect itself? Well, some of the ways that pastors will abuse their congregation include, but certainly are not limited to these, demanding obedience in areas that the Bible doesn't. Demanding obedience in areas that the Bible doesn't. If the pastor asks you to do something which is not in the Bible, he might be exceeding his authority. Abuse of authority is also seen when one makes their opinions equal to Scripture. When opinions of the pastor are made equal in value and in strength to Scripture. There are certain things like that that take place, aren't there? When you stand up at a pulpit, you must wear a tie. <laughs> that, that, by the way, Jesus never wore a tie. I, I can tell you that quite, quite openly. In fact, uh, well, anyway, I don't want to go there. <laughs> how, about, um, how about this? The abuse of authority by pastors appears when they speak harshly to people. When they don't listen to what their people are saying and feeling. The abuse of authority lies when they assume people's intentions instead of clarifying and understanding clearly. Oh, this is a great one. Pastors misuse their authority when they uh, misuse Scripture to justify themselves. And this is one that happens way more than it should, because I've heard it. Misuse of authority, abuse of authority lies when pastors retaliate from the pulpit when criticized. Any form of retaliation within or without the pulpit is wrong. If Jesus didn't retaliate, why should any pastor? Can you see what is central to all of these forms of abuse? Look at them again. In all of these forms of abuse of authority, one thing rings loudly. Well, for example, demanding obedience in areas that the Bible does not means that the pastor is proud. 
And then he's equating his own thoughts as just as valuable and as good as God's. Making his opinions equal to Scripture, again, the same thing. Acting, speaking harshly. He thinks that he can do and say whatever he wants to do because he's the pastor. Ignoring what people say because he's smarter than them. He knows more. He's got the title. He's got the job. They don't, so he can do whatever he wants. No. Absolutely not. Assuming people's intentions rather than clarifying them. Oh, he thinks he's smart enough. He's clever enough. He's perceptive enough that he doesn't need to clarify. He knows where they're coming from. And there are, of course, abusive men who misuse their position and their authority. And guess what you need to do with these people? You need to deal with them scripturally. Tragically, in my own experience in life, I have seen many pastors who have been abusive, who have done things that they shouldn't have done. And these men require biblical confrontation. And because of the extremely high, the ultimate standard of holiness that these men must display as men of God, the abuse by a pastor may even require removal. Whether or not, whether or not, the pastor is repentant. As in the case of adultery. But having said this, how should believers respond to good under-shepherds, to under-shepherds who sincerely care for the believers, who are leading God's people as Jesus Christ would lead them. Our text says this. Listen to this. This is how you treat the good pastor. Let them do this. Do what? Obey and submit. Obey his teaching, submit to his authority. Let them, the believers, let the church do this with joy and not with grief. For this would be unprofitable for the pastor. No, that's not what it says. For this would be unprofitable for who? For you. For you, the congregant. For you, the church member. For you, part of the body of Christ. Congregants owe their pastors the duty of having their obe obedience and submission be of such a quality that it produces joy in their pastor's heart and not the converse. No congregant wants to be in a position of disobedience and lack of submission, of insubordination to their pastor to such a degree that it brings sorrow and grief to that man's heart. I submit to you that a pastor can become discouraged. That a pastor can become brokenhearted when his people do not observe his teachings and submit to his authority. When people don't follow the word of God as it's taught and when people don't submit to one's authority, that can bring heartache, incredible heartache, Especially when that man is an honest man of God and when he does all that he does and he says all that he says for the good of the church, for the good of the individuals and the families in that church and then the people are rebellious and do whatever they want to do anyway. And the people say, yes, I know what the Bible says, Pastor, but... Really? So I'd like to suggest that one motivation for congregants to obey their pastor's teaching and submit to their pastor's authority is loving gratitude. Loving gratitude. You obey and you submit to him based on your loving gratitude. Understanding that shepherding a congregation is a laborious task. That it's a, it's a task which is in every way draining and time-consuming. 
Congregants show their gratefulness, they show their appreciation for their pastor's work by doing these things lovingly and gratefully, by living holy lives, by loving their church, and by doing all necessary to support his leadership efforts. You want to know how to keep your pastor happy? Besides inviting him to dinner or giving him a gift every once in a while? Listen, the best way, church, the best way that you can keep your pastor joyful, gleeful, glad, happy, content, satisfied, pleased, delighted, encouraged, strengthened, to go on, even despite the setbacks that he may have in his own life, in his own family's life, in the lives of people around him, the way to keep him happy is to live holy lives. For you to love your church and for you to do all that is necessary to support his leadership efforts. In a sense, it is every congregant's responsibility to make the pastor's job as easy and as enjoyable as possible. That's how you do it. Listen to me. As if I weren't, duh. Listen to me. You're going to make this church grow. But you're only going to make this church grow if you get out there and you start inviting people and you start sharing the gospel and you start praying for those people and you start discipling those people. It's not the pastor that's going to do it. It is you. So it's not merely giving the pastor a good financial compensation package. And it certainly isn't the occasional, oh, that was a great sermon, Pastor. Because that's not what satisfies the soul. That may puff up the guy, but it's not going to satisfy his soul. What you can do is pray for him and pray for his family and pray for his leadership as your pastor and then join hand in hand and side by side work with him for the greatness and for the expansion, not of this church, for the church of Jesus Christ, not for the pastor's little kingdom, but for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's a different thought. We want to make this church great. Really? Don't you want to make Christ's church great? We want to make this church great again. Really? Don't you mean we want to see the kingdom expand so people can see it here as it expands? The key point in this verse is that congregants bless, congregants support, and allow their pastors to do their work and experience joy best when the believers seek and do God's will in their own lives, living accordingly as they obey their pastor's teaching and submit to his authority. That's what excites a pastor. To have people say, Pastor, what else can I do? Pastor, how can, we, how can I contribute to the growth of the kingdom? What can we do? Pastor, I'm here. My talents, my, my, my finances, my attitude is all at Christ's disposal. Tell me how I can use it best for the growth of the kingdom in this church. That's what it takes We're going to talk about this at some point. But it's not simply putting something in the plate that makes you fulfill the will of God in this church. Look, a pastor's church is hard enough because of all that it entails without people being critical of one another or critical of him or being divisive or being uncooperative of being unwilling to obey his teaching and submit to his authority. Don't make it harder than it already is. The verse ends this way. 
Let them do this with joy and not with grief. What is the this? Well, the this is to give an account. To give an account of what they did. You, the congregants, by your obedience, by your submission, can facilitate the pastor giving an account to God for what he did and do it with joy. Yes, Lord, I preached the gospel. I taught them to do the work of the ministry. But, oh, Lord, was that hard because these people didn't listen. Lord, it was just oh so difficult. You know the pain that I endured, Lord, when they, they criticized one another and they were dividing one another and just at each other's throats all the time and arguing about little things about the color of the paint and the this and that. And, Lord, I, it was hard. But I, I obeyed. You don't want that. Because that's not profitable for you. Well, for this would be unprofitable for you. Let's talk about that. Having a discouraged, grieving, tired pastor is the most tragic thing that could happen to a congregation. Why do I say that? Because when this is true, everything that the pastor does, everything that he says, is impacted by that discouragement, by that grief, by that weariness. And consequently, because this is so, his ministry will be a lot less effective. His teaching, his preaching, his counseling, his, his leadership and all that he does for his con congregation stands to suffer. And if all of that suffers, guess who else suffers? You suffer. Because you lose out on all of the good things, on all of the energy that that pastor can bring to you, of all of the encouragement that he can bring to you. That's why it's so important that congregants obey the pastor's teaching and submit to his leadership. The congregation will want to do all that it can to protect against having a joyless pastor so he can give them and they can receive God's very best. Here's the question. Here's the question for every man and woman in this room. Are you ready? Are you willing to obey your pastor's teaching and submit to his authority to the glory of God? Let's pray. Father, so many times we talk about being submissive to you and your will. And we like to fancy ourselves as obedient believers, as docile to the will of God. But when congregants are disobedient, when congregants are not submissive to their pastors, they're being disobedient and insubordinate to your leadership. So would you plant it in every heart here? Would you implant it in their heart to be willing to obey and submit to their pastor? Would you put it on their heart to do so with great, great gratefulness and love for the man that you place there. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for the awesome responsibility that you've given every church member and every pastor. 
Help us to live those responsibilities out well, that we may hear at the end of the day, well done, good and faithful servant. In the precious, marvelous, incomparable and matchless name of Jesus Christ, amen.